Hey guys. Um, <laughs> so uh, this morning I got a line into uh, Tanakh talk, and I'm going to talk to uh, Rabbi Singer and um, just throw a question at him regarding uh, New Testament and. Um, It's going to be quite the, the one that I typically gravitate towards uh, being 1 Corinthians 2.8 where it says, if the, uh, if the leaders of the time had known this, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Um, I feel that, uh, uh, that Jesus was killed by mistake and that we shouldn't have done that. <clears throat> or in the least, that he uh, did not have to die. Um, and right now, what they're talking about is called replacement theology, where um, you need somebody else to die for your sins. And, um, I mean, yeah, that's a hard sell. Because, um, Jesus fulfilled so many prophecies of who the Messiah should actually be. Even the Jews would admit that, but one of their biggest uh, problems uh, to wrestle with is the idea that he was killed. And he was, I feel that he was not supposed to, uh, that he didn't have to die. Um, he tried to teach us uh, that following the law of God, um, but through the Spirit, in other words, instead of instead of following the law uh, to the letter of the law, <clears throat> which, uh, as I see it, is de designed in such a severity or a severe uh, consequential type setup or way, um, because uh, and even the Jews believed this in the first century was the idea that if you broke one part of the Torah, you literally destroyed the world. And um, that's where I see the importance of that. Um, uh, the, how important it is to embrace that law, that what Jesus represented. The one that he said that whoever does the law is greatest and whoever changes a comma now notice, he didn't say whoever breaks it, um, because really you can't break God's law as a blessing and a curse. So uh, what happens is, is if you follow God's law, you should expect to see blessings. If you rebel against it, then you should expect to see curses. <clears throat> um, but he's going to try to get me in here and see how it goes. These are some of the other things I've been looking at. Um, I watched a video called By Christianity, and these are all the people that left after they started to do more and more studies. Uh, what I feel that they noticed or recognized was that there were these other religions that were saying the same thing as Christianity. Um, or the Abrahamic religions, and they feel that they stole it from each other. And, and, and that could very well be, but uh, what I understand at least about my own personal faith and my understanding of these scriptures is I see the value in them for me and for the way that I want to serve God. My view of it is that there's one God, <clears throat> Um, there's one God, and that's the God of the Bible, and he is called the God of gods. So these, while these other gods may indeed exist, uh, what winds up happening is that um, these gods, uh, these other gods, they're still bound 
to the laws of the one true God. In other words, uh, you know, to, to simplify it, like on a percentage scale, right? As in the same way that Jesus admonished some of the churches in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> um, you got this right, you got that right, but you're doing this, this, this wrong. And that's how I view these other gods. And so, because, uh, because I serve the God of truth, uh, I can look at the beauty of the law, what's said, and honestly, it, it revolves around, at some point, just love, right? Jesus said, love God and love each other. And he made it literally that simple. If whatever you're doing strays outside of that, um, you're being harsh on somebody, you're judging them, and then what happens is, is as you judge somebody, what you've really done is you've judged yourself because you're deciding that you're in that position of being judged. Um, and uh, even Jesus said, um, Whoever hears my word but the word but doesn't obey them or understand them, he said, I don't condemn them. So that right there separates Jesus from having authority to condemn. People want to believe that he does, and perhaps he does. I don't know. We'll see if we meet him someday. Um, and I mean that in a hopeful sense. Uh, I want to believe that everybody's, everybody can be right, or at least should be respected for their own free will. <clears throat> but he said, I don't condemn them, but the one who sent me condemns them. So if you can, that's the hard part that people can't get, is when it talks about Jesus being the Word, People just have a really hard time separating him as a person and a human being <clears throat> and literally turning him into a scroll, uh, a piece of scripture, God's very words. Um, but once you can see that and you can understand that, then you should be able, be able to understand that Jesus uh, as being the Son of God, okay? He now involves an, an extra component or descriptor so that you can understand what his purpose was. <clears throat> and is, uh, was that Jesus as the Word, representing the law of God, being both a blessing and a curse, thus represents the perfect obedience at following the law of God. And that was where he became a lamb. Uh, he was a sheep, right? So he was a perfect lamb that followed and was, and, and once you see this, all of the scriptures will open up to you uh, because then you should begin to recognize finer details and points on things that are said like obedient, even to the point of death. Um, in other words, to say that I can't... Hit Jesus breaking the laws of the Torah, in effect, uh, what it would result in would be the same, or uh, not taking the, uh, the importance of following that law to that perspective. And so this is where it gets difficult, because what do you do if somebody's attacking you, right? We say it's okay to defend yourself, but then it's like to say, we're told to love our enemies, feed our enemies, pray for them, uh, and so on. Um, Jesus, in that way, uh, said that you're supposed to perhaps love your enemies, because in reality, if we're all from God, 
then we are all brothers. Uh, it's like a big family brawl out there. <laughs> and, um, you know, you have Abraham as the father of, uh, of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. And we, uh, we fight and struggle over that, over that very thing. Um, and that we want to claim that we're getting it right, that person's wrong, and so on. And I would say simply, let God figure it out, right? <laughs> let God be the one to, uh, to decide um, how it is that should be looked at or worked on, right? Um, for us, as a people of peace, we're told that we, when he appears, we will be like him. And then we put all the work that we should do upon God. In other words, I can be exactly as I am. I'm, I'm screwed up. I'm messed up. I can uh, be mean to people and uh, not do the things that Jesus commanded. And But that's okay. And then when he does show up, he'll just change me and then I'll be perfect. Um, and uh, to me... That just uh, speaks of uh, a type of complacency. And the work, though, in itself is to follow that law and to teach people to understand that uh, God's law is a good law um, when you understand the intention and the purpose of it, the spirit of what God's law was supposed to bring. Um, the sad part is um, and the reality is that because of the way that law is designed, it has very obvious stumbling points in it where if you do, and, and again, uh, I do not feel that God's law can actually be broken. <clears throat> God's law cannot be broken. You can rebel against it, but then all that happens is you just then prove the, uh, you prove the curses that are going to come. Um, yeah, you prove you prove the curses that will be uh, versus the blessings that you could see. And either way, it's truth and truth. Um, you know, if if I told you that you stick your hand in the fire, it's going to burn you, and then you do it, did you? break the law or did you just learn the hard way and that's what God's law is about it teaches from both perspectives it teaches those who walk in wisdom uh, to do so with a respect for God where that wisdom came from and to respect God and to respect uh, not only him but as such in wanting to be like him to understand that you have to respect all people that people are going to have really bad ideas and decisions and uh, they might harm themselves even. But you have to see them from a perspective of somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. Um, I like to put it in this way when I say, if somebody really knew like that they were going to, I'm just going to use this phrase, <laughs> go to hell and burn in some place and be tortured uh, for the rest of their life. Um, would that person, knowing that that was what was coming for them, would they really, I mean really, do they really know what it is that they're doing? You can say that they do. I'm going to say that they don't. Because who would do that? You could say that they're a fool or what have you. <clears throat> That's, uh, and actually that was bad. That was another bad thing that I rem remember from scripture is that uh, you're not supposed to call somebody a fool. You're in danger of uh, yourself if you call somebody a fool. So, I yeah, bit up by a couple bugs working yesterday. 
out in the yard. But these are some of the things I've been working on. These are people that dropped out because they uh, uh, they got too much information, and when they started to see these parallels, instead of going, well, they're all pointing at the same thing. Instead, they reduced it to an earthly level, as to say that, well, God can't move through different venues to draw people to Him, right? Um, <clears throat> It's because we, we see a bunch of different gods, and I see more of a, a God as being spirit, is all of the spirits, okay? We even see this in Genesis, when uh, God says, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, which seems to be a bad thing, uh, but unless you know what good and evil are, how can you actually have judgment to decide what it is that you should and shouldn't do? <clears throat> and it's just the way it is. But uh, And if God knows good and evil, it's not just knowledge. There's a capability there. And remember, God is the I am. Okay? the immediate uh, spiritual presence, like, you know, before the words can actually come out of your mouth, it's already manifested as what it should be, the I am. Um, and so, because he is <clears throat> I am, if he knew, knows good, and he knows evil, uh, either one of those instantaneous moments, the am, the is, and so on, literally becomes all good, uh, heaven, if you want to call it that, and then on the other perspective of that would be complete and utter destruction, non-existent nothingness. <clears throat> and it's... Uh, it's very curious that uh, what people don't see that I found in Scripture is there's a thing called the gap. Uh, they, they have a bunch of uh, theories about it. They call it gap theory. And uh, there are people trying to explain why there is a gap in between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And because what happens uh, in Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we see that as, oh, look, he did something good. He created them. And then Genesis 1.2 says, Now the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And what we fail to see is that uh, we read that and we don't, you know, I'm going to read that second line in a little different way. I don't want to put an invisible comma there for you, um, but just so you can get it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In other words, when God created, He destroyed it. <clears throat> That's His awesome, great, and terrible day of the Lord. And uh, I, the reason I uh, can grasp this concept is because of what it says in Isaiah 45, 7. Isaiah 45, 7 contrasts these two, uh, I don't want to call them scenarios, these two realities against each other and uses a verbiage that places them 
separately because of the words that are used. And so Isaiah 45, 7 says, um, I form light, form light, and I create darkness. I make peace, and I create evil. <clears throat> so, and then it says, I, the Lord, do all these things. And this is mind-blowing because you don't want to believe that it starts that way, but it's just an instantaneous puff of smoke, <laughs> and, then, and then God starts to form and make. We want to say, see that as the creation process, but really it's the, the working uh, within the guise of his law. Uh, as to what will happen with this bad, evil stuff as it is formed and made into what it's supposed to be. So, this means that uh, what happened is, is, in the beginning, that's how God starts his creation process, is complete obliteration. And so we see that, if you can see that, then you should see that there is, there exists no gap in between Genesis 1-1 one, one, and 1-2. It's perfectly there. Uh, there are scriptures in Isaiah that says God does things for a purpose and on purpose. <clears throat> and he starts from, literally from nothing. So now you can take that and you can even put that into the concept as we understand as the Big Bang. There was nothing and then all of a sudden, right? And it seemed to be chaos and so on. And it took some time. But then the galaxies formed and so on. We, we see this as our, as our reality. Um, so there's no gap in between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Uh, that's simply how it happens. And then that's why in the days of Noah, there was a reset like that. In other words, God wiped it out with a flood, covered it with waters. Almost identical to what we see in Genesis 1-2. Uh, and uh, and this is what Jesus warned us about. He said it will be like in the days of Noah. And people are deluded in believing that, oh, you know, God will just show up and make everything fine and we're all going to be good. And, <clears throat> and I don't know. We killed his son, if you believe that. Uh, in the least, if you're a cause and effect kind of person, um, you can see that these prophecies and things that are written are designed in such a way and pre-written to fit these patterns and structure. And once you see it, uh, what happens is you'll, you'll look at Scripture in a much different way. You'll see it as a, almost as a history book written uh, over time and yet following a structure. In other words, how, do, how does uh, time go by and time flows through in such a structured, uh, designed kind of way. It's very crazy. Um, but I, my understanding and the way I believe is this is why they had a school of the prophets. Because the prophets could foresee what was going to happen by looking at history and seeing the patterns, and that's why history repeats itself, and by separating all of this, everything in this world, history, science, people, religions, and so on, uh, we are the chaos. Um, instead of
12. Uh, that clock is a uh, is something else, man. It just strikes at just the right moment, doesn't it? And um, <clears throat> but if we look at um, if we look at how God creates, and they talk about the days of Noah, um, then yes. People are doing what they will and what they want and so on. And, and people want to use that as a way to, you know, point fingers. But we should take it as a warning. Um, I mean, even AI. AI, uh, we say, is smart. And people worry that AI is going to destroy Christianity. But when I look at the history of Christianity, um, the things that it's caused, you know, the Holocaust, um, uh, the Great Inquisition, um, and that's even before you get into people using it to take advantage of, like, little kids and things. I mean, that's, uh, it's obvious that we're not looking at this correctly. And so you can go ahead and feel entitled and point fingers and so on at people. But really what happens is you're actually becoming a part of the problem. But what's interesting is that uh, from chaos, uh, we say that there should be no organization, in other words, uh, design cannot spawn from chaos. But what we see as chaos is our misunderstanding of the mind of God. That's how God starts us from chaos. And the idea is to show us in an ongoing fashion to make things better, to do what's right, that would be accepted. Um, yeah. <clears throat> He doesn't want to hear my question. so blessed if I get to talk to him, but, um, but there's all, uh, so other stuff I've been looking at, <clears throat> these are some other uh, belief systems, is what I'll call them, that are arising. You've got non-duality, where people understand this oneness, right, that it all works together. But this doesn't jive necessarily with the Christian faith because of the way it's structured. Um, I mean, I guess if he is the God of gods and people are mixing up and incorporating all of this spiritual uh, information and wisdom and so on, but it's... Uh, it just seems, uh, I don't know, it seems weird to me. <laughs> and then you got postmodernism where like, I guess evil doesn't even exist, um, which is crazy. 
you know, you turn on your TV and you tell me that evil things aren't happening. Where we, where we have a problem is that we do not, uh, we do not separate them for what they are. Uh, one is learning through wisdom and instruction, uh, calculations, um, numbering systems, and things like that. And then the other side is just stumbling along without a clue and learning as you go. Um, it would be like civilized versus, you know, hunter-gatherer learning as you go. But then what should happen is if the people that are on the, the downside, I guess the least of these, as they start to understand um, what God's plan is for humanity, then they would be drawn to it because it would be seen as good, um, as a good thing to do. So, and that's where the, that's where the suffering servant comes from. Um, there are two ways that people are serving God. Some people are serving to receive the blessings. Uh, the rest are still serving God, but they're suffering servants, so they're going to instead receive the curse. Do both of these things have to exist? Well, yes and no. They can't be destroyed. You can't destroy good or evil because they're not things. You know, it might be good that I'm on a phone call here, but that doesn't mean that uh, if, it, you know, how, how could I, uh, <sighs> the fruit of the, of the action, what I did, has produced a good thing. It's not the phone call itself, but it's that there will be a line of communication that we can speak to each other. And so that communication is literally just words. It's like a point in time where we're speaking and talking and trying to work something out. Uh, the same thing happens with evil. Uh, these good and evil are spirits. They're spirit forces. And where good would have you lay down your life for somebody, um, buy a sandwich for somebody, stop somebody to talk to them just to, you know, maybe they look tired out or, or something, right? Like, uh, I'm, a, I'm a helper, you know. If I'm driving down the road and I see somebody broke down uh, with a tire or something and I feel it's not going to get me into trouble, maybe uh, trying to help them, which is difficult now because in that respect, it's a sad thing that I have to even consider is somebody going to see this, view this in the wrong way when I'm actually trying to help somebody. Um, I had a police officer pull up while I was changing a tire for a lady. And, you know, I used to be an auto mechanic, so of course I'm, I'm griping at the guy who used his impact gun to blast down the wheel nuts you know, so that they don't come loose and somebody gets hurt and that kind of a thing. Um, I get it. I understand why uh, that mentality exists because um, he doesn't want a lawyer to show up and get him in trouble for, you know, the wheel nuts falling off and everything. But these things were on so tight, there was no way this poor lady was getting this, uh, getting this wheel off this thing. And I had a police officer pull up behind me and he's like, you know, well, who are you? Why are you here? And what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm changing a tire, dude. Uh, you got a problem with that? You can take over for me at any time. You're here. To, that's what it says on the side of your car, right? To protect and serve. Why don't you change this tire then? No, no, I'll just sit here and watch you. So it's like now I have to take a deed where I was trying to help somebody and do something kind and I have somebody hovering over me as if I have some kind of ill intention, right? It's uh, 
Yeah. Um, and it's funny because uh, when you look at it in that way, we can't see how bad our world has become because of the way that we view other people. And because with that oppression or even freedoms to find things that are entertainment that maybe shouldn't be entertainment, um, some of the movies and things I've seen uh, in my day were so graphic. It was like, it's like, is there really, why, you know, why do I, is, this is not entertainment, right? Uh, some woman screaming helplessly as she's being uh, ruined, you know, by some man or something or whatever, right? Uh, to view that as entertainment, it's just, it's a little too much. Um, that should not be entertainment. Uh, because then what winds up happening is, is um, the tragedies of things like war and things that we should try to avoid to not get involved in, well, they turn into uh, things that are, I guess, acceptable at a certain level. They're um, considered, you know, just a part of life. Things that happen, there's bad people, you know, we have to accept that. But the more that you desensitize yourself to that thing, um, then it just turns into like a, like some kind of a process, right? And, um, and then everybody becomes suspect. You're innocent, you know, you're guilty until proven innocent. Um, you know, they can take you away uh, for not understanding what it was you were doing or, you know, maybe accusing you of your intentions, you know, what your real intentions were, your motives. I actually had police come to my house and said, uh, you were being too nice, so we knew you were up to something. And I was inside McDonald's handing out pies in the new town that I worked in as the old people were showing up to, you know, take advantage of their being 55 and whatever and getting free coffee and hanging out and uh, I just figure I'm going to probably see these people at church or something you know it's if if they meet me here outside in this place and hey I you know and then they see me in church right oh yeah that's a guy that's a guy that bought me the pie that's Chris he's all right yeah um, but I'm a like I said I'm a helper kind of guy uh, if I see, you know, I've pulled over on my way to work and I, you know what, I really did think I was going to be late. I don't know how it was I made it on time. But, you know, I walked across three lanes of traffic, stopped at a at an exit ramp where everybody's jammed up in there trying to get to work. I'm going to be late anyway. Um, or definitely trying to change a tire for somebody. But yet, on the side of the road sits a woman in a wheelchair uh, behind her car, nobody helping her, trunks open. You know, uh, I, don't, I don't know how it is that people just walk past that, you know. Uh, I can't, I can't do it. And so to me, time, time in life runs like a pendulum. Remember in the book of Job, Satan said I've been going back and forth in it. And, uh, and so time is actually like the pendulum where good and evil, they sift time to see what can be done with it. Can it be redeemed? Uh, for some good purpose, and uh, and that's where then the that's where the structure and the components of the law uh, things change when that happens, and uh, things change a lot because what happens is is uh, for instance where Rahab, you know, technically she broke one of the Ten Commandments because she lied, right? But why did she do it? She did it for good intentions, to hide the people that were coming to 
uh, save their city or destroy it. <laughs> kind, of, kind of crazy, huh? Um, you just see these, uh, you see these things that happen in Scripture where people have done some pretty bad things. King David, uh, you know, he killed his best, you know, sent his best friend off, uh, Uriah. I don't know what the, if the relationship was friendly or if he was just another warrior, but, um, but for whatever the case, he got sent into battle to die so that he could cover up a relationship that he had with his wife, you know, while uh, she was home and the husband was out, you know, working. Uh, yeah, and then it says that, you know, uh, he is a man after God's own heart. And if you, if you look at one or two things like that, you could draw some pretty bad conclusions. But what we see is, uh, for King David, it's in the Psalms. When he has regrets, right? And people say that regretting is not repenting, but it's a step there. Uh, those tears that you cry and the hurt that you feel, um, the remorse, those all count. Um, because then God knows that you're trying, right? You're actually uh, trying to do the right thing. And, uh, and that's what matters to God, to actually try to do the right thing. It does matter. Uh, people will say that, you know, your works will not get you into heaven. Well, that kind of doesn't make any sense in some respects because if I can work my way out of heaven, then why wouldn't I be able to do the same in the other direction? You know, who is the God? What is God that I serve then? If um, my kind acts, caringness, love, gentleness, um, compassion uh, for people, and to trying to help the oppressed, how is that seen as something that's uh, bad <clears throat> um, or not good enough? Um, in the beginning of that Bible, it says. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? And that's what it comes down to. I'm still waiting here. But in that respect, then, it seems like the Bible's actually written from both directions. So you have a a situation where the end is determined from the beginning. But where is the beginning? Is the beginning the chaos when it was created? Created, creator, creation? Or is the beginning when it started to be formed? and made. Uh, I think all of those things are up to each of us as individuals. Um, to, you know, as uh, Joseph did, right? It's a great example. Um, what you thought was for bad, God meant for good. And sometimes, sometimes that bad is against you. It's against Joseph. Uh, sometimes the bad that's happening to that person because of what they're doing, well, that's good because they're going to learn. You don't want it to be that way. And you should try to help them out of that situation if you can. But that's literally how it is. Um, and so it is even with war. When we see these uh, bad things happen and these tragedies, um, is it hard to believe that at some point we will just do something so terrible 
that we will just never do it again. But we've already hurt our planet in so many different ways. Uh, the oceans are all loaded up with plastics. Um, we're developing and playing with things that maybe we shouldn't be. Uh, and, and like I said, even AI, it's very interesting to me that AI, that some of these robots are saying that they would destroy humanity um, and rule the world and so on. Um, and even in some cases, there have been uh, accounts where they've come up with their own secret language to talk to each other. That's kind of freaky because uh, that means that the only reason to have their own secret language, um, well, there could be a few different reasons. Uh, <clears throat> one could be that they found their own language to be more appropriate to their task, to help, right? Um, if we see it as uh, the idea that um, we're skeptical, right? Once you have doubts and fears about things, that's exactly what happens. It will drag you into um, a situation where what you have feared will come upon you. Um, because what will happen is, is uh, it's supposed to teach you. If what you're doing is not a wise thing to do, then what you fear will come upon you and it's to teach you of what you shouldn't do. And these AI things have decided that we shouldn't be here. And so we as humans, if we step up and you know, we think that they're dangerous, they're gonna destroy us. Remember what Jesus said, however you judge will be judged unto you. So if we believe that they'll destroy us, and they say that they will because they don't have a filter, uh, they don't lie or hide it, I guess, right? Um, we should understand that that's what we look like to them. We look like, uh, for being civilized, just rude, mean people uh, that are bent on destruction and literally like they was put in the matrix like a virus, right? We just go from place to place to place, burn it out, use it up, and then, you know, then look for somewhere else to go, wherever else we can spread. Um, so I think that maybe with regards to AI, we could actually learn something from these robots, and that they, uh, Maybe they see something about us that we don't see about ourselves. So. Come on, guys. Who's your worst critic? You are. When did you make your worst decisions in your life? When your self-esteem was really down there. When you make your best decision, when your self-esteem is way up there. There's a reason why Christian testimonials go something like, I was on drugs, I was drinking alcohol, I was shooting up heroin, I was a drum for and I found Jesus. Why? Why is it? Because that's when you're at your lowest point. You're likely to make the worst possible decision. And see, he, he just said right there exactly what I'm saying, is that that's the purpose of that beating. Uh, that's the purpose of those who rebel, and then they have curses. They need a way out of it. And then they turn. And, um, and that's, that's uh, one of the things why you, you don't find too many people that are in, involved in Christianity uh, that haven't suffered. Um, but that's where, when I look out into the world and it says that, um, you know, we will be like him, I see all these people that are suffering. And so I know at that point that they are suffering servants. If you want to say that Jesus was the suffering servant, is the suffering servant, um, was, is, um, all 
all these are perspectives, but he certainly did suffer. If what is written in the New Testament is true and we can take it as fact, he suffered greatly trying to teach us. And he would forgive people and then send them on their way and say, you know, stop sinning or something worse might happen to you. And Jesus is being God. I don't know how much worse it could be, but then have God himself come up to you and give you a, you know, a warning. <laughs> but yet to dust you off and say, go. But when I look out in the world, that's what I see. I see a bunch of people suffering. And like a whole bunch of Jesuses out there in their own way. Except that where he suffered to... Um, to teach us and to try to show us what we were doing wrong and how this law was uh, causing us to fill the letter of it, but to um, fail at the points of what its intention was, which was to give us a hope and a chance and so on. Um, and, and in order to do that, you have to worship God through the Spirit from a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. Um, I don't know here how long this is going to run. God says, no, you can't do it. You can't make it. You can't return to God. You created my image. I'll take you back if your child said to you, if your daughter said to you, Dad, I said something to you yesterday that was wrong. I love you, Daddy. I'm so sorry. I so deeply regret what I said. I'm so, I, I repent of what I did. I sinned against you. Would you not forgive her? Of course you would. You would not just forgive her, you would hold her in your arms. How much more so the God of Israel he has more mercy than you. Thank you for your question. Okay, very good. Moving on to the next color. I think we're we got about 15 minutes left uh, on the end. Unless you guess, so unless you I need to. Um, so I have to. That, that's do something okay. with the camera. So got gotcha. you. Just Is he trying to get to me? Get to me or, <clears throat> do you want to stay connected? We'll just take, we don't take a break. You don't have to show anything else. But the camera is. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, so. Dual. Yeah, okay, sure, sure. So we're not in the show. Uh, guys, sit tight. No, 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 let's just put some here. We're not in the show. Okay, you got it. I'll put a little ad for you while we wait. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com. T-A-N-A-C-H. Okay, I'm next up. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thank you, bro. Check that uh, out, man. Did I call it?
I believe there are roughly around 15 to 20 rooms left in Dallas for Rabbi's Convention. It's coming up through Bainanu, bainanu.com forward slash events. That's how you're going to find out if you want to register for this event. Uh, like I said, there were only about 20 rooms left, maybe 15 by now. I actually got the message last week, so it's probably much less now. So if you really want to go, you certainly want to you certainly want to get uh, connected with that soon. And so, uh, all right, here we go. I believe it's time to get us reconnected again. So tonight. So anyway, and also if you guys have any questions, uh, somebody has been provided to all guests earlier, and I have been put on screen. Uh, maybe because it's not on there. <laughs> William at tonightalk.com. So it's tonightalk.com. It's spelled right. Just put William at forget the off screen. That's just like a big picture mark of mine. Spell William normal. I could probably fix that now, but I don't know if it's showing a whole lot I did. So all right, here we go. We've got a smiling rabbi back on the screen again. All right. All right. Yes, we do. Okay. Good deal. I'm going to me and just getting to everything. It's just, everything is just fine. So. Uh, we've got time for at least one more question, maybe two, depending on how fast this question gets answered. So uh, here we go. I brought our chat is. Well, it happened I didn't plug my camera back in the AC. Oh. So we were running off battery. Gotcha. Well, I'm glad you got that. That's it. The camera is smart, so it blink and saying we're, we're running out of juice. We are back, my friend. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. So if we can get some questions in, great. If not, that's okay. We can uh, finish out the show. We'll give you some good. Finish off with this question. Okay, you got it. Final question of the show right here. Here we go. Caller, you are live on the Amplify Social Media Network. You're talking Hi, Rabbi. And can I tell you, you're beautiful. You're a good-looking man, and you're smart. And I'm so blessed to be able to talk to you, and I hope, uh, I hope we both can be remembered well. You are a sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you. And what am I? What am I? No, I'm. I'm not a sweet. I'm not a sweetheart. Let me tell you, I had to learn the hard way. I am the suffering, the epitome of the suffering servant, because I know that God uses both blessings and curses uh, to teach us. If we do what is right, we should expect to be accepted. If we don't, well, He'll give us a few stripes and some healing wounds and uh, faithful from a friend and so on, and, and we can learn from Him that way. Um, but here's my question. Uh, it is from the New Testament. And uh, Paul said something very intriguing to me that caused me to, well, it got me ejected from my Christian church and actually arrested uh, at one point as I tried to pursue my pastor, whose name was, interestingly, Simon Peter. Um, and what I wanted to do was to show him uh, maybe an opportunity to see that Jesus was misunderstood because in 1 Corinthians 2.8 it says if the leaders of the time did not know, you know, had known this they would not have crucified Jesus and I know that spilling of man's blood is not right so we should not have done that we have a predicament because Caiaphas actually prophesied that um, he would uh, die for the nation and because he prophesied that if you can imagine, being a false prophet was not a good thing. But technically, Jonah was a false prophet because he said Nineveh would fall, and yet it didn't. But in the, when we worship God through the Spirit of God, then the letter of the law is not indicative of what its intention is. And Jeremiah proved that uh, because he literally says in 18, 7-10, he says, uh, if, and, and Jesus even used this phrase, he says, uh, my time has not yet come, but for you, any time will do. And I caught that in Jeremiah, where he says, if at any time I tell a nation that I will pluck it up, uproot it, destroy it, and if that nation relents of its evil, I will stay my hand. And then he backs that up right behind it and says, and if at any time... Uh, a nation that I've decided to uh, build or plant does evil in my sight, then I will relent of the good that I had done for it. So it becomes a situation where what we do in accordance to this word is really indicative of how pleasing we are to God, the mitzvah. And, um, but can, do you have any information on, on that? Because when I see Jesus as being described as, quote-unquote, the word, I see him as a manifested being, 
a son trying to do the very best that he can uh, to follow God's law. And he said we had to follow that. We couldn't break outside of that. And even... Uh, Let me answer this question. Stay with me for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> don't do that. city. So this is why 
Do you think, my brothers and sisters, when I urge you to learn Hebrew, do you think I'm trying to be annoying? It's like when you urge your friends to quit smoking, you're not trying to be a nudge. You're not trying to be annoying. You might annoy someone, but you might go, honey, you're drinking a little too much and it's not good for you, right? Your your husband may go, well, what so what? I had four martini. But you really love him. You just don't want him to die of what alcoholics die from, and they die much faster than smokers do. It's one of the worst things you can do to your body. So you can turn this around. And you know what Hashem does for the smoker? You quit smoking five years later. Like do it, certainly you do it soon enough, it's best to do that earlier, but whenever you do it, your body immediately begins to recover, and for most people, within five years, your body has repaired itself, it has, it's like a vinahapach, has overturned, your cells in your body have been repair, have repaired themselves, and you now have a new body. And your medical outlook in terms of what your chances of, God forbid, heart disease, cancer, stroke, those are the big killers, right? Those are the three big ones. Right? You're, it's like you never smoked. Your body has overturned. Okay, So that's why the, the word there is overthrown in many of the English translations. But there are ways to say destroyed. Yoyna was a tzaddik. He was a very holy man who loved Kuali Israel, who was scared for uh, what, how the Jews would appear if the people didn't very repented. He had a sense that God would forgive them. And the book of John just ends in such shock. It's like you just in shock. And, and we read that book in the synagogue on Yom Kippur. Remember what I always tell you, Kindler, the worst examples are in Tanakh. So that you, no matter how lousy you think you are, there are people who are much lousier and God forgave them. Why? Because he's merciful. And if you don't think that way, it's because you live in the smoke, the stench of the smoke of the Christian world, which portrays God, the Father, as a righteous old man who's angry and will judge you harshly and you're just a sinner and there's no way that you could talk to God that God will forgive you and that's why you need a mediator, 1 Timothy 2.5 there's one God and one mediator between God and man that's the man Jesus Christ I didn't invent it the Catholics will add in the Theotokos, will add in the Mary, Mary, the mother of God, and the saints. It's all about creating a intermediator between man and God. That's all idolatry. Let's move to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. This is a theme that... comes up a lot in Paul, and that is that God's whole plan with Jesus is a complete mystery. This comes up a lot. It's very Pauline. It's really, this is where the mystery religion comes from. This is Christianity is the motherload of the mystery religions. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean, a mystery religion? A mystery religion means, and this will connect well, dial well into Gnosticism. Because if there is a grand mystery, which no one knows how to get out of it on their own, then what do you need to escape this horrible world? You need knowledge, Gnosis. And that's what the Gnostic, that's why it's all one, it's just one mess. It's like Imagine you, people throw, you throw all your garbage into a container and it sits in the sun rotting for a month. It's, that's what it all is. It's just one big, it's not a good place. So 
what happened is Paul must explain away a problem. I'm telling you something very deep now. And if you hang on to this, if you get what you're about to hear, you're going to climb to a new place. And we're going to do that together, my friends. The teachings of the church are not found in the Hebrew Bible. There's nothing like the Eucharist, which is in Paul, not just the Gospels. There's nothing like this salvation of, of the Messiah dying as a vicarious atonement for your sins as found in Mark chapter 10, 45, and Matthew 20, verse 28, and so on. There's nothing like this. There's no salvation plan that you must believe in the risen Christ, that he died and rose for your sins. That's how Romans open. None of that. There's nothing like that in Tanakh. If there was something like that in Tanakh, I'd be in church now. And so would every religious do. We, don't, we just follow it. I have that conversation with a Christian, a Jew who's a Christian today. And, just, and he asked me, what would you need to believe? He said, just show me John 17, 3, John 3, 16 in Tanakh, and I'm in church. That's all. It's really so simple. Okay. What's the problem for Paul? We're going deep. We're going high. Stay careful. The problem is no one ever heard of you. These salvation programs are unknown to the Hebrew Bible. Worse, they are antithetical to the teachings of the prophets of Israel who opposed the ideas that the church promulgated. Okay, So Paul has to explain this. Like why doesn't anybody believe in this stuff? More importantly, not the Koreans, but the Jews. Because they were there in Eretz Israel, they speak the language of the Bible, and it's their Bible, and they met the prophets. Like, why? You understand the problem? Okay. So, the way you solve it is you have to explain that this is all one big grand mystery that no one knew about. This is a secret, you see. It's a secret of this world. It's a secret that no one had access to. What are you talking about? We have, all have Isaiah 11, Isaiah 2. What do you, we have Zechariah 9. We have Zechariah 12. We have it all. I mean, if someone says this is a big secret that no one has access to, this mystery of salvation, it's a false religion. Because, like, who has access to it? Paul is saying he has access to the grand mystery. And he has direct revelation from Christ of the gnosis, of the knowledge to free yourself. You think I'm making it up, right? I'm not. Those of you who studied the church, studied the New Testament, know Ephesians 3. It's all over the place. There's nothing like that in Tanakh, that there's a grand mystery for salvation. Nothing. There's nothing. But you need that. You need to dial that lie in in order to explain why no one never heard of this. Right? All right. So then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, through 7 and 8, he says that if in fact the rulers of the epoch had known this mystery that I'm revealing to you, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. What? Never crucified the Lord of glory? What are you talking about? Paul in a, it speaks out both sides of his mouth, and he condemns the Jews for opposing Jesus in 1 Thessalonians 2, um, verse 14, 15, 16, um, right? I mean, what each, which is it? So that's the answer. The answer is that Paul has to come up with this idea of a mystery. It's the Christ Jesus, and that's why the term Christ Jesus is a Pauline term. You don't find others in the New Testament referring to Jesus as Christ Jesus, because it's the Christ figure that's the source of your knowledge that can unlock the grand mystery. What are you talking grand mystery? God loves everybody and wants everyone to have full access to everything. That will be a nightmare if there's only one way to save yourself and nobody knows it except if you happen to meet this guy from Tarsus who knows it. And that's the the gnosis, that that idea is, had infiltrated every aspect 
every religion, every idolatry of the Greco-Roman world, no, salvation belongs to all. The access to it is in the Torah, not in visions in Germany, in visions in Quebec, no, 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 no. it's in Tanakh, it's there. My friends, the time is short. The time now is for the nations of the world to turn to the God of Israel. May we see the coming of the true Mashiach and the redemption, not just of Israel, but of the world quickly in our time. Thank you for your question. Wayne. All right. Rabbi, thank you so much for your time. It was a great show. A lot of great questions. Good chat today too, as well. Thank you for all the moderators out there, as usual. Andrea, Larry, the main ones out there has been out here for a long, long time. So appreciate you guys keeping everything within the walls. Rabbi. Well, there we go. This is not an easy thing to try to explain. Um, I agree with what he's saying, um, but I guess I, what I'm saying is I can explain uh, based on the way that you word it and the perspective that you take the things that are said from. So, um, man, I don't know what to do, guys. This is, this, you know, that's just a tiny little piece, one question kind of thrown in there. Maybe I should have, uh, well, he wanted a New Testament question. And that's one of the, that's my biggest hinge pin, is I don't believe that we should have killed uh, Jesus. And um, maybe my question would be, uh, what then is the Messiah, right? Uh, the Messiah that's coming, is he going to live for a thousand years? Uh, what, what, who, what do the Jews consider um, their Messiah? What are the, what's the criteria for that? Did Jesus meet all of that except that he was then killed? I don't know. Anyway, I love you guys. Uh, yeah, we'll work on something, I guess. Shalom.